Uh, you know, again, getting to see the faces of each and every one of you does not make you nervous at all. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm not going to do any introduction because um, Remy is probably want to will probably want to keep me off the stage. Otherwise, I have a lot to cover and only 40 minutes, like he said. So I'm going to dig right in. I think we're all past the why SVG is so great phase, right? And we all know it's so good and we all know um, it's right here. It's getting better every day. Uh, browser support is really good. Look at all that green. Um, if the only browser that doesn't support that that don't support uh, SVG are IE8 and below and older Android browsers. Now some features have different support across browsers as well, but basic support for SVG is this. And now if you have to provide, and by the way, this is going to be a very technical talk. It's going to be drier than uh, than Brian's, as particularly because I don't like cats, so you're not going to see any cats. <laughs> So it's just dry. Um, okay, so if you still have to support the IE8 and below and, or older browsers first, browsers, first of all, I feel very sorry for you. And second of all, there are very numerous ways that you can do that. Uh, there are more different ways to, you can embed an SVG on a web page. I'm going to cover all of them now. Uh, for each one, you have at least one or two ways to provide fallback as well. Um, why am I going to talk about embedding techniques? Because they directly affect the kind of animation that you want to, to apply. You may or may not be able to apply some sort of animation, so you may have to make compromises and choose a different embedding technique um, in the end. So what we will cover, it's not going to be in this particular order. Uh, first of all, when to use SVG, uh, how to embed SVGs plus fallback options, and then animation. Uh, overview of CSS, ML, JavaScript, and CSS animations, all the bugs, uh, basically headaches that will make you want to avoid it right now. 3D transforms, if any, sprite animation techniques, there are three, and line drawing with a nifty um, addition. So, first of all, when to start, when to, when to use SVG? Um, I still get this question a lot from people. Uh, they are sold on SVG, they want to start using SVG, but they're not really sure when or how to use it. Um, I usually have a rule of thumb to follow, and I usually have also two checkboxes in my head that I have to check before I use an SVG. First of all, it depends on what you do with it. If you just want to display an image and you're not really sure if SVG is a good format for that image, there's a rule of thumb I follow. Photographs, raster images are the preferred format when creating or working with continuous tone images such as photographs. These are not good SVG candidates. SVG is preferred format for images like user interface controls, logos, icons, and vector-based illustrations. So this is the first checkbox. If it's a photograph, I don't think about it. If it's a vector-based illustration, okay, that's the first checkbox. The second checkbox is, first one is, is the image a good candidate for SVG? The second one is, is SVG a good candidate for the image or not? Uh, an example here, I wrote a, a big chapter for the Smashing Book 5, it's all about SVG. So when I was working on it, I wanted a real life example. I wanted to see a logo that would be a perfect candidate for SVG, and the Smashing Magazine logo was the perfect candidate. However, when they sent me the Illustrator file, they're, they're currently serving a PNG file. When they sent me the Illustrator, I was very optimistic. I know SVG, I can optimize it, make it really great, and they can use it. Uh, first of all, the default file size was 10 <coughs> kilobytes, which is too big. So after optimizing it, I couldn't slash the file size by a lot, so I ended up removing all of the lighting effects and drop shadows and gradients that they have added, and that still reduced the file size only to 40 kilobytes. The PNG version they're serving is 5.9 kilobytes, and that can even optimize that to half that file size if, when, if they want. So, <coughs> if you have to choose between an SVG that is 60 kilobytes, for example, in size, and 6 kilobytes PNG, definitely choose the PNG. Now, if you're only serving a static image, the only benefit that you're going to get from SVG anyway is that it's crisp and looks great in all uh, different screen resolutions, right? But this is not really a problem, because using picture or source set, you can provide different versions, the 2x and 3x of your PNG, and you can serve it for different screen resolutions and always have it look good. So, is the image a good, for, a good candidate for SVG, and is SVG a good choice for that image, particularly for performance? Now, SVG can do much more than just display images. Uh, first of all, it's really good, great for icon systems. These, are, these still count as images, so SVG is a great format for that. SVG icons are superior over icon fonts. The only, the only uh, valid argument that I got from one person once about whether icon fonts are better than SVG was that the file size of the icon font was smaller than that of the SVG. But then there was uh, someone else who used SVG, replaced the icon fonts with SVG, and they ended up with a much, much smaller file size. So that's not really a rule. SVG is generally superior, so definitely use that. Uh, they're great for ad banners, Flash is dying, uh, blocked in Firefox and Chrome. Uh, there was talk by someone from Facebook calling people to basically kill Flash. 
So we need an alternative. HTML5 and SVG are perfect for that. Um, SVG is perfect, again, for infographics. Infographics are usual images, and we have text inside of them. That text cannot be selected, searchable, or, or made accessible. Even if you provide an alt, um, and yeah, if you give a value for the alt tag for that image, that's not enough, because you have a lot of data inside of that infographic. But with SVG, the text of inside of that infographic is going to be searchable, selectable, accessible. It's 100% real text. So SVG is fantastic for infographics. It's also great for data visualizations. Um, again, there's a lot of competition between Canvas, WebGL, and SVG in this area. Um, SVG brings accessibility to the table. Uh, Canvas does, there is some talk, I think, uh, I haven't dug into it, but there are, uh, I think, two methods that enable you to make the contents of an SVG accessible. But you, in order to do that, you would have to provide a second, second, um, um, so you have the content inside of the canvas, which is not accessible, and between the opening and closing tags of the canvas, you would have to provide the secondary content, and then make a link between them so that the, the screen readers knows that that element is the one that has been clicked on the canvas. It's too much work, but uh, performance-wise, SVG can suffer sometimes, so if canvas is better performance-wise, definitely choose that. Uh, they're good for animated illustrations. Jake Archibald is a great example of that. In his articles, he uses a lot of illustrations. Uh, they're all SVG. He explains the concepts that he writes about using these illustrations animated. They're a great use case for that. SVG comes with filter effects, lighting, blending modes, masking, clipping paths, etc. And you can apply those not just to SVG, but to HTML as well. So we can solve a lot of design problems, a lot of, you can find a lot of design solutions using SVG that we currently can't with CSS. And last but not least, it's simple uh, UI shapes and arbitrarily shaped UI components. Basically anything that's not rectangle, SVG is great for that. Uh, these shapes that you create with SVG, if it's an empty div and you create a star or a robot or whatever, these are not real shapes. These are fake shapes and they're not semantic. Uh, definitely use SVG for that as well. So, six embedding techniques. There are actually seven. The seventh one is the embed tag, which is currently not, not, uh, not used a lot anymore. So I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm going to talk about the different embedding techniques and the fallbacks for each one. There are some lesser known fallback techniques. That's why I wanted to mention the fallback. Um, because some of them are really cool. So, which one should you choose before I go into them? You're gonna, you, know, you have to know that with SVG, because of its nature as both an image format and a document format, and because some, some, implement, uh, some embedding techniques accept scripts, some of them do not, you're so, you have to filter your options down, set priorities when you really need to know what you really need to do, and sometimes you need to have to make compromises. It just is like that. So ask yourself, is the SVG animated? Is it interactive? If it's interactive, you cannot use it. You, can, you cannot use an SVG as an image, for example. Um, what kind of animation? Does it require JavaScript? If it requires JavaScript, there are some security issues with image tag and background image, for example. Um, what browser support do I need? CSS animations work in most browsers, but they don't work in a lot of IE versions. So again, which support do you need? What kind of content and fallback do you need, such as the infographics? Um, infographics, if you create an SVG infographic, the best fallback that you can provide is tabular data, depending, of course, on the infographic itself. But if you have data inside of that infographic, presenting that data in a table and providing that table as a fallback is the perfect way to do it. Um, OK, so the first way to embed an SVG is using an image tag, just like any other image format. It has pros and cons. Uh, the image can be cached. It does require an extra HTTP request, but with H2, it's not going to be a problem anymore. Uh, you, there are no CSS interactions, hover, uh, or even JavaScript inter interactions, they don't work. Any kind of interaction does not work. No JavaScript for security reasons, and CSS animations only work if they're defined inside of the SVG. So if you have an SVG and you want some sort of animation such as uh, morphing shapes, we cannot do that in CSS today, so you would have to use JavaScript or SML, which um, don't do that, I'm going to get to that next. So you're going to have to use JavaScript, so this is not going to be an option anymore, even if you initially thought that it would be. Um, image fallbacks. You, have, you can provide an image. Uh, you can provide the fallbacks for an image, either be dependent on JavaScript or not. Uh, the JavaScript dependent is, you do feature detection. Is it you, you do feature detection using modernizer, and then you replace all of the SVG formats, SVG references with their PNG or Jacob or whatever fallback. Uh, this works great. The JS independent, this is not really 100% an image fallback, but it is a substitute to image. If you want to embed an SVG as an image, as a foreground image, and you want to provide fallback without JavaScript, you can use, you have an SVG inline, inside of an SVG you have the image tag, which is an SVG image, 
different from the ING, obviously. The image takes xlink href. The image tag in HTML takes the source, right? So what we're doing here is we're providing both the xlink href and the source to the browser. If a browser supports SVG, it's going to read this one and it's going to, uh, to render the SVG image. If it does not understand SVG, it's going to render the image as an ING and use this source, the fallback, as the image itself. So you get a no JavaScript fallback solution. The second way to embed an SVG is using the picture, picture tag, which is pretty much the same as image, except that you get the benefits of um, art direction, you get a default fallback mechanism, you provide the SVG inside of picture in the source, and the image tag, which always has to go inside picture, gives you the default fallback mechanism. Refer to any other image format or anything you want in that image. Um, you can also embed an SVG as a background image in CSS, again, just like any other image format. All the same benefits and disadvantages of an image tag, except that the SVG is cached as part of the, SV, uh, as part of the style sheet. Now, to provide fallback for URL, again, you have multiple ways. The first one is feature detection, class names, modernizer. If there's no SVG support, just provide the element with a different background image, which is the PNG fallback. Or, if, you don't, if you're not using modernizer, if you're not using these class names, you can simply use the multiple background strip. Basically what you're doing is, first of all, you're, you're using the PNG, not the SVG. And then you're adding a second declaration, which uses two background images. The first one is no background image, and the second one is the SVG. Why does this work? Uh, this works in most browsers, except all the ones, because generally speaking, if a browser supports SVG, it also supports multiple background images. If it supports multiple background images, it's going to ignore the first declaration and it's going to override it with the second. Browsers that don't support SVG don't support multiple background images and will use the fallback and at the top. Now, object is my favorite um, SVG embedding technique. It's also the, the most flexible one. The image is cached. You get scripting with JavaScript, animations included. Uh, it comes with a default fallback mechanism between the opening and closing tags. And CSS animations and interactions also work, uh, only if they are defined inside of the SVG, or if uh, you're referencing them from inside of the SVG, if they are in, a, in an external style sheet, but the reference is inside of the SVG, of course. Now, there's something to note here. Beware of multiple requests. Most people, when they want to, if, they, if, they're, in, uh, if, they're, if they're referencing an SVG image here, my SVG or SVG, and they want to provide a PNG fallback, what they do here is they have an image tag that references that fallback, PNG. But that's not good because if a browser does support SVG, it's going to request both images. Multiple requests, bad. Don't do that. So the way you would do it instead is you add a div, an empty div, and the fallback image is provided as a background image for that div. Browser, SVG capable browsers are not going to request this. But browsers that don't support SVG are going to use the background image. There's another fallback technique here. It's similar to this one, except that Instead of providing the background image in CSS, you provide it inline inside in the, uh, in the HTML, in the same page. You have, in the same page that you have the object, you also have the fallback that is defined inside another SVG. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is because if you have two SVGs embedded inline in the same page, the styles in one are going to affect the elements in the other. If you have uh, same class names in two SVGs, and you have styles in the first one, for example, and styles in the second, the seconds are going to affect those in the first one as well. They're going to override them. So this is general, it, it trips some people off, it's, so it's really good to know. The third fallback is plain accessible text, as I mentioned earlier. This is perfect for um, infographics, for example. Um, yeah, it doesn't even have to be tabular data. Any kind of text or image fallback is great. Iframe is practically essentially the same as object. There are some minor differences that <coughs> I admit I'm not really, uh, I don't know what the exact differences are, but I don't like iframe, I just use object. Um, in my SVG, uh, the image is not cached, of course, unless you cache the page. Uh, no extra HTTP requests, uh, but sometimes it can bloat the page, especially if the SVG is really big, so I generally avoid this. I only use inline SVGs for simple icons. Uh, scripting, you get it. The scripts can be anywhere, and CSS animations and interactions work perfectly, just like with HTML, uh, when it comes to where you add them. So, this Providing fallback for inline SVG is one of the lesser known ones because generally most of the developers that I know when they embed an SVG online, most of the times they don't care about IE attributes, so they don't care about providing fallback. However, you can provide fallback in multiple ways. The first one is you can simply add text, plain text, inside of the SVG. 
If a browser does not support SVG, it's going to ignore the entire SVG, but only render this text here. You can even add uh, links to text, basically HTML. The second way to provide fallback is you, inside of the description element, which is, for, uh, which, uh, is available in SVG for accessibility. You can provide a title and a description for an SVG to make it accessible for screen readers. Uh, inside of the description, you can provide HTML content, and again, if a browser does not support SVG, it's going to render that content. <coughs> fallback number three, um, just like with the image, you provide an image here that's with the source instead of the xlink href, and browsers that don't support SVG are going to reference this. Now, the empty xlink href here is required for IE because it makes SVG, uh, IE9, for example, some IE versions that do support SVG are going to request and download the other, the other uh, well, they're going to be double requests. So in order to provide, a, to, to abort the download of the second request, you add the, the xlink href. Now, there are uh, details about this in this um, second article. Okay, I'll do it next. There's a fourth fallback mechanism, which is functional processing. This is probably the least known fallback mechanism. SVG comes with a default way to switch content. Um, it's uh, conditional processing. You have the switch element. It has some attributes, but in all of the tests that I've done, I've ne I never had to set any of those attributes, so the switch alone was enough. So you have the switch. Inside of it, you have the use, if you're rendering an, an icon, for example, a Twitter icon. And then after it, you have the foreign object. And inside of the foreign object, you can place any kind of HTML content inside of an SVG. Now, the way the, bro the, way the browser does it here, if it does not support SVG, it's going to ignore the use and switch to the content inside of the foreign object. No JavaScript required. And again, uh, you have here a div, uh, Twitter icon fallback, and you provide the fallback icon as PNG inside of the CSS. Or you can do it again with an inline SVG and provide the fallback like that. This is actually uh, avoid the most request in SVG capable browsers by adding this to the page. Always add this because Sometimes, some browsers are going to request both SVG capable browsers, so make sure you just remove the fallback altogether, give it display now and background none, and that's going to uh, avoid the double requests. Uh, you can read all of the details about these uh, techniques, including some browser bars in this article on the scripts. Now, a quick animation recap of all of the embedding techniques. First of all, the embedding techniques, what kind of animation works for that technique, uh, interactions basically don't work for SVG as image, and they do work for the other techniques. Uh, I'm mentioning SMIL, but you know, just as a good to know, but it's it's currently being deprecated. Uh, CSS, 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 no JavaScript for the first three, and the rest work perfectly. Uh, the location of the animations, all of them require that the SVG that the animations be defined inside of the SVG, except inline. Uh, inter inter just JavaScript location for SVG as image, it's, it doesn't work anyway, and it can be anywhere for the rest. Now, if you do embed an SVG using an object and you want to access it using the script on the main page, you have to do that by, first of all, make sure that the page is loaded, because uh, otherwise you're not going to get into that SVG, because it's not loaded. Uh, you get a reference to the object, and then you use the object, the reference or content document. The content document attribute, or property, is used to retrieve the content document inside of the SVG, and then you use that to start, um, you know, retrieving elements, styling, animating them, and do everything you need. So basically, all you have to do is use the content document to get inside of the SVG document, and then do whatever you want to do with it. Now, to optimize or not to optimize, I'm going to dive right into animation next. But um, optimization. Generally speaking, it is recommended that you do optimize your SVG. But if you're going to optimize, if you're going to animate it, most of the times, you probably have some certain document structure, and you're going to work based on that structure. You have groups uh, that are wrapping some elements, you have IDs that you're not using inside of the SVG, but that you want to use in your script. If you optimize the SVG, most optimization tools are going to break, they're going to change the document structure. If you already have animations, they can break. If you don't have animations, the structure is going to change, and they're not going to work anymore. So, if you're optimizing it, um, I usually tend to optimize it by hand instead of using an optimization tool, and keep all the structure that I need. Animation, if you have it, don't optimize. Don't optimize using an optimization tool, such as SVGO. Now, CSS, SMIL, or JavaScript. Um, don't use SMIL. It doesn't work in any version of IE. There's no future plans to embed it in MS Edge, so don't use it. Uh, Chrome, it's already been deprecated in Chrome. You can even see warnings if you have a page that has SMIL inside of it. There's a warning in the console that says that it's going to be deprecated. Uh, CSS only useful for simple animations, you're going to see why. 
and JavaScript for any kind of complex animation or serious animation that you just need to work across browsers. Uh, the types of animation, uh, transforms, they can, you can use CSS, you can use JavaScript, but because of the bugs that I'm going to mention next, I recommend using JavaScript. Path morphing currently doesn't work in CSS. There's talk about adding a D attribute, D property in CSS so that you can start animating them, but they're not there yet, so JavaScript. You can animate paths using smell, but again, don't use smell. Uh, line drawing, CSS or JavaScript. I'm going to talk about this in more detail later too. Again, recommended JavaScript for a good reason. Uh, color and other simple animations and transitions, changing the color, moving an element from one place to another, CSS and JavaScript, uh, CSS is recommended. If CSS can do it, if it works across browsers, definitely use CSS. Now, animating SVG, the good, the bad, and the ugly. First of all, you cannot animate all SVG attributes using CSS. There is only a handful of SVG properties that can be animated in CSS because only a handful of SVG attributes are available as CSS properties. Now, there's, this is, these are all of the attributes that can be animated in CSS. These are also attributes that can be animated in CSS, but these are only SVG. You, you, for example, all of the font, font family, font size are available for HTML elements as well, but these are not. Anyway, this is the list of all of the attributes that you can animate in, in, in CSS. X, Y, width, and height are not currently included. So if you have a circle, you, ch you want to change the position, you want to change the radius, or width and height of a rectangle, you can't do that in CSS right now. It will be possible in SVG too. The list has been extended, but you know, we're waiting for implementation. I think it was implemented in Chrome Canary last time I checked. So you can do that in only in Chrome. Um, most properties are animated on SVG elements just like they're animated on, SV on HTML elements. But uh, there is a fundamental difference when it comes to transformations. In HTML, if you transform, if you rotate an element uh, by any degree that you want, the default, the default center is 50% by 50%, which is the center of the element itself. But the default transform origin in SVG is 0, 0, and that's not the top left corner of the, of the element. It's the top left corner of the entire SVG canvas. So if you have a rectangle here, this is the HTML, and this is an SVG in gray and a rectangle inside of it. I'm rotating both of them by 45 degrees around 50, around, no, I'm not specifying any transform origin here, sorry. So in HTML, it rotates around its center. This is the expected behavior. In SVG, it rotates around this center here. This is not what you would want. So the way you would change that is you can change the transform origin, of course. Uh, if you use percentage values, the value is set relative to the, to the element's bounding box. There is no concept of, of a box model in SVG. You don't have a box model. But instead, there's something called the bounding box, which is the smallest rectangle that traps any element. So it's, it gets you a little bit closer to the, uh, to, to the box model in CSS, but it's not really the same. But if you set the transform origin using percentages, it's going to be set relative to that bounding box, which is good. If you set the transform origin using, rela uh, using absolute values, pixels or m's, it's going to be set relative to the entire SVG. So if you, for example, transform origin 10 pixels, 10 pixels, it's going to be 10 pixels, 10 pixels on the SVG, not on the element itself. This is different from, uh, from HTML. Now, uh, setting transform origin and percentages <coughs> is buggy. This is the most common, it makes sense if you want to set tr transform origin using percentages is a lot easier than using absolute values, right? Uh, Chrome we have, uh, the green is, a, is an SVG rectangle and the purple is an HTML rectangle. If you set the transform origin to be 50% by 50%, you're setting it to the center. In Chrome it works, i.e. in Opera don't honor transformations on SVG elements, so you have no support in those. Uh, Firefox used to have this bug, this bug has been fixed but it's still worth mentioning. Um, it has been fixed. Uh, if you set percentage, uh, the transform origin using percentage values earlier before, it, uh, Firefox didn't use them. It just didn't work, but now it does. Uh, starting Firefox 44, it does work. Uh, Safari uh, does transform, as you would expect, but if you zoom the page in or out, it gets messed up. So that's, again, very buggy. Um, this is the main reason why I don't use CSS transformations on SVG at, at all. Um, there's another thing, this is not a bug, but this is how SVG just works. This screenshot is from, uh, from the Greensock website. Um, so if you, have, if you have an element and you're applying multiple animations to that element, multiple transformations, you have rotate, 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 and you want to change the transform origin for every rotation. First you want it to be on the top left, then you want it to be on the bottom left, bottom right, whatever. This is the behavior that you would expect. You would expect it to move to the third step from the second step. 
But the default behavior in SVG is the browser is going to jump back to the initial position, change the transform origin, and then jump to the final position again. So you're going to end up with this. This is not what you want. This is how SVG works. This is not a bug. So again, this is not really what you would want. Uh, generally speaking, JavaScript is best for any kind of serious animation like that. Uh, CSS 3D transforms, they uh, don't count on them yet. They don't work. Uh, Firefox is the only one that does support CSS 3Ds on SVG elements. Chrome does, well, I don't think it counts as support if, if it's two dimensional. There's no uh, perspective, so it's flat. So it's not 3D. So you can do that. So if you have an SVG, uh, I had a recent request from one of my clients who's had the simplest animation ever. You have a butterfly and he, he just wanted to add that, uh, what's it called, flutter effect? Yeah, he just wanted to add, it's just a simple rotation in 3D, but I couldn't do it in SVG because it's not supported using CSS. And I also didn't want to use JavaScript because they didn't want to use JavaScript. So you can do that using simple sprite, the, uh, not simple, uh, the standard sprite animation. There are different ways to use sprite animations in SVG, so we're going to dig into those next. First one. Um, SVG as background sprite animation. This is practically the same, uh, just like a PNG sprite. How many of you know how to um, animate a PNG sprite on a background element? Cool. Okay, that's not a lot actually, but uh, that's cool for me, you know, because I'm talking about this stuff. <laughs> so this technique treats an SVG image just like the PNG sprite image, exactly the same. You have an image here. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to, uh, talk you through the steps, and then I'm going to show you an um, interactive demo. The SVG image would have all the frames drawn inside of it. You have uh, any kind of, a walking man, for example. And an example here, uh, this was uh, by Simon, aka Simurai. Um, he's the first one to have written about this technique. It uses uh, yes, the CSS steps function. Uh, so you have one image that contains all of the frames. And then you animate those frames, just like all time animations. You have frames and you animate them certain speed during a certain, over a certain duration of time, and you get the animation. The SVG is used as a background image on an element, an HTML element. The position of the SVG in the background positioning area is animated using steps, thus showing only one frame at a time over a specified period of time. Um, this is the code. Uh, I don't have any specific values here. This is just the general rule. You have a background image which points to the SVG. Width of the element is the width of each frame. I'm going to show an interactive demo again. There's a height and there's the animation which uses steps the number that goes inside steps is the number of frames, okay? And then you define that animation, um, and, and the keyframe animation, and change, the, you're just changing the position of the element. This is how it works. So, you have this sprite that contains the different waving positions, and all you do, okay, I sped it up here. It's freaky. So all you do is you just change the position in the background <coughs> position area, and the faster you go, the more, the smoother it, it, it gets, and the more, of course, the more keyframes you have, the, uh, I mean, the more frames you have, the smoother it gets. So I'm going to show you the difference between this and not using steps. So how does steps? First of all, this is the animation. It's slow right now. If you speed it up, oh, no, I'm slowing it down. If you speed it up a little bit, this is the waking animation, okay? If you show this right, it's just moving. The position inside the background positioning area is just moving very quickly. Now. Steps function, I have it here. It's too small. So it uses steps. We have 10 frames. So the value that goes inside steps is 10. Now suppose we're not using steps. Suppose we're you're using linear, for example. Now use the monkey stop. Don't show this part. What did I do? Well, I can't refresh it because there's no internet, so... Let me just try it again. It's not showing it at all. Well, what you would get, instead of only showing one step at a time, right, uh, kind of like, a, literally, like steps, you would just see the background transitioning like this, moving. You would see the empty spaces between each frame. That's not what you want. What steps does is it moves through the values one step at a time. And you want it to move from this background position to this background position one step at a time, not transitioning in a linear function. So you use the steps function. Now this is how an animation works. If you have a 3D animation effect that you need, this is how I would do it right now. Um, okay. 
The SVG is treated just like a PNG image, and it is used as a background image for another element. Now, there is another way that you can do, which is very similar to this one, but instead of using the SVG as a background image to an HTML element, you have an independent SVG. So how is this different from the technique number one? Uh, the SVG is used as a foreground image, not a background image. Um, the frame animation happens inside of the SVG, not inside the background positioning area. Again, I'm going to show how. The frames inside of the SVG are positioned on top of each other, they're stacked on top of each other, and then each frame is animated into view by changing its opacity, because uh, visibility and display cannot be animated because they don't have ordinal values, so you use uh, opacity. The frame animation uses steps again uh, to animate each frame independently but concurrently. They all start at the same time. So how does it work? Uh, Peter Pickering wrote about this technique on Smashing Magazine, so this is, so this is just um, an explanation of this technique again. So suppose we have three frames, an SVG that has three frames inside of it. One, two, three, just because I was too lazy to come up with something nicer than this. Uh, also, this shows the effect uh, clearer. So we have one, two, three. You stack them on top of each other, the frames. And then you wrap them inside of a, um, a, a group, and you give that group a class name. So the CSS for that looks very small on screen. We have frames and child one, which, which is the first element. Frames and child two and and child three. Each one has its own animation. All of them start at the same time, but the first one, the opacity. First of all, the, they all have opacity zero, and then they show in different at different times. The first third of the of the animation duration shows the first frame, and then it disappears again after 33.33%. At 33.33, the second frame is set to opacity 1, and it disappears at the end of the second third. And then the third frame is shown on the third third of the animation, and this is how you get it. They're all animated at the same time, except that the, uh, um, what's the, word? the time at which they are shown is different. They're all animating at the same time, except that first of, uh, the one of them is, has the opacity 1 set on the first third, here. The second one is shown on the second third, and the third one on the third third. Now, the more keyframes you have, the more you're going to have to divide the animation duration into smaller parts. Uh, so, in the animation timeline, each animation starts before the previous one finish, uh, finishes. Actually, no, this is wrong. They start at the same time. The sum of all animation is the duration of the entire animation. And uh, so the duration of the, visibility, of the visibility of each frame is equal to the total animation divided by the number of frames. Uh, this is an example from Hayden's article. So you have a shark. Uh, he is going to be animating his tail. First, the tail is the three uh, different frames of the tail are stacked on top of each other, and then he uses this exact same syntax here, except with ordinal values, to achieve this effect. And the nice thing about this technique is that you can have multiple different animations inside of the SVG. This is a sprite animation. The blinking is another sprite animation. You have different frames for the eyes, and you're animating them exactly the same way. Um, all of the details in this article on Smashing Magazine. Uh, this is another example, again from this article, just to show the difference between doing this um, on the right, which uses the frames, and the one on the left has the, the arm fixed, but you're just rotating it, and that's not really a natural movement. Now, what would be even more natural than this is, this is a path, right? This is a line in JavaScript and, and, and SVG, and what would make it even more natural is being able to animate the shape of that line. So you wouldn't have to worry about different frames. You would have, have just one shape, and you're changing the shape of that shape. Uh, this is possible, but currently only using JavaScript. And we're going to talk about that later. Uh, the technique number three, responsive SVG sprite animation. I'm going to look at your view box here. I'm going to go a little bit over time. Uh, so the SVG is independent again. Instead of multiple frames, the SVG uh, contains multiple scenes. So I'm going to show you an example. Each scene is brought into view or shown inside of the viewport depending on the side of the viewport. So you have uh, responsive animation. If the screen is big, you're showing the full composition with the animation inside of it. On smaller screens, you're showing a different view with, again, animations inside of it. And even, you know, any, as, as many different screen sizes or viewport sizes that you want. Uh, or the SVG is cropped, to put it in another way. The SVG is cropped so that only one scene is visible inside of the viewport. And the viewbox is used to do this cropping. So how does it work? Um, first of all, this is how the SVG will look like. This is the entire SVG. Inside of the SVG, you have scene number one, scene number two, and scene number three. I'm going to get to this next, but first let me explain a little bit um, about the viewbox. Uh, this is an interactive demo. Uh, when I first 
started learning about Ubox, I understood nothing about it. It was a black box. It took me two weeks to fully grasp it. Uh, so I ended up creating this interactive demo. There's a cheat sheet with, um, well, it's basically very useful, not because I did it, but it's really useful. <laughs> so uh, let me get this viewport. I have eight, what, 800? The fact is, when you work with SVG, you have two coordinate systems in action, not just one. The first one is the coordinate system of the viewport, and the second one is the coordinate system of the canvas, where all of the drawing takes place. So, the coordinate system of the viewport, you don't have to worry about it, you can even forget it. I don't think about it at all. So, what I have here, uh, the gray one is the coordinate system of the viewport. Uh, it's the default coordinate system. As soon as you give the SVG or the browser computes uh, the width and height of the SVG, it generates this coordinate system here. Now, the blue coordinate system is the actual coordinate system where all of the drawing is taking place. Uh, let me get back to 800. By default, first, initially, if you don't change the value of the view box, they both have the same values. Two coordinate systems are identical. Now, if you start changing the values of the, of the view box, things start to change inside of the SVG. You can scale elements up and down. You can crop the SVG to only show parts of that SVG. It's basically superpowers. It will take your SVG skills to the next level, it saves you a lot of time troubleshooting SVGs a lot. Seriously, you, you, you're going to impress people with skills. I've done that. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start by changing the values for the view box. I'm increasing the value of the coordinate system inside of the SVG where all of the drawing takes place. This is the view box. Forget about the viewport. Okay? By default, no matter how much, how big, or how small the viewport is, it's going to fit inside of the viewport. Uh, think of an SVG, it's essentially, practically the same as an iframe. You can have an iframe on a page embedded. The, inside of that iframe, you can have a page that is really big, but you can only show, uh, only one part, a small part of that page is shown through the viewport of the iframe, right? With SVGs, it's exactly the same. Except that, by default, instead of having to scroll to see all of the content inside of the SVG, the view box, which is the page, goes, fits, is fitted inside of the viewport. This is the default behavior. You can change that using the preserve aspect ratio attribute, but that's outside the scope of this, um, of this talk. Um, so, you change it. Think of it as, this is exactly, almost exactly the same as object fit and object position work. These are new properties. Or you can think of it as background position. Talking, this one. You can think of it as background positioning in, in, in CSS. You can, you can set the background, the background size to either cover the entire background positioning area or be fitted inside of it, contain or cover, these two values. And you can also change the, the position of the background inside of the background positioning area. This, these two, view box and preserve aspect ratio, treat the view box inside of the viewport, the visible viewport, exactly the same way. Now, what I want to do here is, um, I want to crop this image. First of all, you can change it. You can I'm going to get back to the default and show you how you can crop it because this is what the animation technique relies on. Okay. To crop that SVG, suppose you only, you only want to show um, this area here between 100 and 200. 100 and 200. 100, this, uh, this small um, square here. So you have this. Just imagine the square. You have to help me with that. So, the top left corner of the square that you want to show, the area that you want to show, is here, at I oh know here, at 100 zero, and the width and the height are 100 by 100, right? So you can crop the SVG to that area by changing the value of the of the view box. The view box has x, y, width, and height. These are the values of the area that is visible inside of the viewport. So if I change these to 100 by zero. It start gets, starts getting cropped. Um, the width and the height, I have a minimum here, okay, so I can't do that. I'm not really sure how useful this is anymore. So you can crop the SVG. You specify any area inside of the SVG, the top left corner of that area, and the width and the height, and use these values for the view box. And this is exactly how this technique works. So, in this example here, First, at first, you, have, you would have the viewport that have these dimensions here, width and height, so that only this area is shown inside of it. The view, the view box would have x, y here, the width and the height of this rectangle here. Now, if you want to change on smaller screens, you want to show a different scene, 
you would have to choose the x and y to be here, the width and the height to be the width and the height of this rectangle here. So you can do that inside of Illustrator. What I'm doing here is you select the scene or any element. There's one of the three main sparking techniques in SVG use the exact same concept. You have icons inside of an SVG, and if you want to display only one icon at a time, you get the bounding box of that icon, or, or the binding box of the scene here, and you use those as a value for the view box. Now, you can get these from here, from the transform uh, panel. Make sure the top left corner is the transform origin, and then x, y of this point here, and the width and the height, and if you set those, if you give the, the view box these values, only this area is going to be visible inside of the SVG. You're cropping the SVG to that area. So if you resize the screen and change the value of the view box as you resize the screen, you can end up with an, a responsive SVG animation. First, on bigger screens it would show a full composition animated. You would animate these with SVG, with, uh, with CSS, with JavaScript, any way you want. And the smaller the screen size is, you use the view box to crop it and, and show a different scene inside of it. Um, this script here is a very basic example. It has it shows only two different scenes inside of an SVG based on the 500 pixels point. Uh, this script is from an article by Sarah Dresner on Smashing Magazine. You should definitely check that out. It, uh, she has written more details about this than I could possibly cover here. Uh, so you're checking for uh, the MQ matches, match media, basic JavaScript, um, and you said you just change the value of the SVG attribute from one value to another. Enable background is not really necessary. I don't not really sure why she has it here, but it's not even supported in any browser. So all you have to do is just change the value of the viewbox. Why are we doing this using JavaScript? Because view, viewbox is one of the attributes that still cannot be set using CSS. If it were possible in CSS, you would use media queries in CSS, change the value of the viewbox in CSS, and end up with a responsive SVG. But it's not yet possible because there is no a viewbox property in, in CSS. There is hope of adding it in the future, but I'm not sure. So, animating SVG with JavaScript. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because the same exact same concepts apply, um, except that it's JavaScript. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to use JavaScript and you want to avoid all of the headaches that we mentioned earlier, you're going to use a JavaScript animation library. Uh, the most popular ones are GreenSock, GSA, uh, Snap SVG. Snap SVG is called, also known as the jQuery of SVG. Literally, the jQuery of SVG. If you want to do any kind of DOM <coughs> manipulation. Um, setting, adding, removing classes, anything like that, Snap SVG is great for that. I use Snap SVG for DOM manipulation and GreenSock for animations. Velocity, I hear it's great, I've never used it, and D3JS, mostly used for data visualization and stuff like that, I've never used that either. So GSAP's strength, why do I love GSAP? I'm not paid to say this, it's just a fantastic library. It gives you the ability to stack tweens, it gives you the ability to create precise timelines, control tween delays, um, specify moments in time to start animations. You can tell any tween. You could have a sequence of a chained tweens, and if you want one of them to, to start as a, at a specific moment in time, independent of the rest, you can do that. You can also start animations relative to each other using relative labels. You can start multiple tweens at the same time using one label for, for all of them. Incredibly flexible, amazing. I've, seriously, you just have to. I, I, I had a friend of mine. Uh, he was using CSS animations, I was talking to him yesterday. Um, he was using CSS animations for some effect, and he was also using AngularJS in his project. He was, you know, he, he, the animations are starting to get complex, chained, and stuff like that. He was suffering, literally. So I said, why don't you, why don't you try GSA? Um, he was hesitant. I said, you're not going to regret it. Seriously, I always say that. Um, he did, and after like 10 or 15 minutes or so, he started raving about it so much that uh, he is, he, he's currently thinking about writing a blog post about how he integrated GSAP with AngularJS and replaced an entire SVG animation library, that's what he said, with one line of GSAP. It's that powerful. You can nest timelines, you can create time lapses and slow the scenes just by changing the, uh, the time or the duration for every scene, uh, for every tween, for every set of tweens. Um, you can morph shapes without with, uh, in CSS, you cannot morph shapes. You cannot change one shape into another using CSS because there is no D attribute available as a property. Uh, you can do that using Smell, you can do that using Snap SVG, you can do that using any other animation library practically. But um, all of them, and this is the default animation behavior generally, if you have a shape and you're morphing from one shape to another, the number of points in the first has to be the same as the number of points in the second. But GSAP removes that restraint. They, 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 they don't have to be the same. You can morph any shape in a sure example. Uh, it also comes with line drawing, text animation, and much more. Examples are 
Uh, first of all, they have the split text plugin. Uh, they are, it comes with a set of plugins that you can add and remove to your needs. It doesn't have to be really big, uh, big in size. Effects like these can be created using just a couple lines of code, literally. Um, this is the text. Morphing shapes, you can morph any shape into another shape. They're morphing this word, these letters, into this character. Heart into star. Even if a shape is not a path, you can set it. You can tell Greenstock to turn the shape that is not animatable into an animatable shape, into a path, and then animate it into another one. It's extremely powerful. Definitely recommend it if you're going to do any kind of animation like that. Um, <coughs> uh, GSAS animation capabilities also include motion along the path, which is now possible in CSS but still not supported in all browsers. Uh, advanced text animation, draggable, there's a draggable plugin, shape morphing, again, I'm not paid to say this, I promise. Uh, shape morphing, uh, line drawing, and much more relative color tweenings. There is a pen, um, you can check it out when I show the slides. Uh, this is the last, this is the technique that I want to focus on here. Line drawing, how many of you have used or are familiar with line drawing in SVG? Great, so you can imitate line drawing using SVG. Uh, this one here. Jake wrote an article, he was the first one to write this article about this technique. So he's using it, uh, I think I took a... No, this one is animated, wait, I'm going to show you the animated version. This one, this is it. So this is line drawing in SVG. You literally draw stuff. But the line drawing effect is essential in animated stroke offset. The stroke is a perfect even line, just perfect even line. It's not jagged, it's, not, uh, it's just smooth. Uh, with perfect line edges and the equal amount of distance between the edges along the entire path. The okay, this is how it works. So this is an interactive demo. You have a path. First of all, using the dash array, let me get back to this. <coughs> using the dash array property, you can set the, uh, the length of the dash and the length of the gap that comes after it. They, they both have the same value. So as you increase the size of the dash array, the more you increase it, you're going to get to a point where the size of the dash is equal to the size of the entire path. Now, if you animate the dash offset, which is the, where, the, where the dash starts on the, on the path, if you change it, you're going to end up with this. And if you change it back, you're drawing a path. But you're not really drawing a path. You have a stroke, and you're just changing the position of that stroke offset on the path. Um, this is, you can do it in CSS, because these two properties, stroke dash array and stroke dash offset, uh, are both supported in CSS, but you, you need to know the length of the path and use that as a value for these two properties. That's not always going to be possible, so generally speaking, again, use JavaScript for that. Now, there's a nifty technique here. What if you want an effect like this? This is not a smooth line. This is not a smooth edge. If you want it to be more um, freeform or hand-drawn effect, you can do that using clipping paths. Uh, basically, this is the stroke. You make it thicker. And then you clip it to this shape, which is the shape of a hand-drawn um, letter, for example. Um, you define the clip path inside of the depths, and then you apply it to the path, which is your stroke. I can't go into more detail already over time, sorry. Uh, sometimes you can get into issues like these. If you clip the path, you can end up with something like this. So the, the way to go around that is to split the, the, the path into two paths and apply different clipping paths to each one of them. Um, that's all I have to go. Thank you.